So as Peter said, I'm calling in um, today from California where I live. I'm actually at my mom's house where we are sheltering in place together as a multi-generational family. And I'm coming to you as the space maker and CEO of a global nonprofit called Of By For All. And what I wanna do in this workshop today is really invite all of us to play with the ideas of what it means to be not just for our communities and our audiences, but becoming of and by them as well. And to start, before we dive into the workshop, I wanna share for about 15 minutes um, some framing ideas, and then we're really gonna put you to work both in the chat and with that paper and pen. If you don't have paper and pen, it's okay, but if you do, um, that'll be great and it'll add to the fun. Um, so before we talk about of, by, for all, and the work that we're doing now, I wanna start by going back to the work I was doing about nine years ago. So um, I wanna invite you to think back to the last crisis, at least in the US, the last big economic crisis was the 2008 economic crash. Um, in 2011, I became the new director of the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. I was a first time director. I'd never done management before. I'd never done fundraising before, which if you know the American model is a big part of the job. I was a past exhibit designer and uh, educational program developer for museums who was taking over this museum. And I wanna invite you for a moment to imagine sitting in the seat of a brand new museum director and discovering two things almost immediately. Uh, first, that you are completely out of money that the museum is a week away from closing. And second, that most of the community doesn't know and doesn't care. Um, in fact, this building where this museum was had previously been a county jail. And there were more people, I believe, in Santa Cruz who knew that it used to be a jail than knew that it was now a museum. And it had been a museum at this point for almost 20 years. So we had this dual crisis, a financial crisis and a crisis of relevance. And we had to figure out what we were going to do. I know a lot of organizations right now are in a different kind of crisis, but fundamentally it connects to these factors. How are we gonna stay alive financially? And how are we going to be relevant and meaningful to all the people in our community we believe we could serve? And we decided at the museum that we were going to move away from this traditional model of institution first design, where the institution makes an exhibit or a program and then sells it to somebody. And we were gonna to flip to what we saw as a community first model, where we were going to really learn what mattered to people in our community and then use that to develop new ideas, new programs, new exhibitions. So we took this fundamental approach to say, this museum is your museum. And you'll see Spanish here as well. Um, the county that I'm from, Santa Cruz, is about 35% people who are originally from Mexico. So one of the things we had to do to fully embrace our community was to think about how people who are Mexican born were part of the story. And so you'll see some Spanish sparkled throughout some of the things that we did. We decided, Sí, que bueno. Um, we decided that we were going to flip the museum from being something that was about seeing what somebody else had done to inviting people to participate as well. This is from an exhibition called Everybody's Ocean, where we invited anyone in the county to contribute an artwork related to the theme of the ocean. Um, we held a lot of events where we focused on bringing in collaborators not all professional artists or historians, but people like these DJs who are able to teach people how they make their craft, whether it was fire sculptors or whether it was um, you know, radical crafters, all different kinds of people partnering with us to reach different audiences. We invited people to bring their own voice in. You know, I think it's so typical that in a cultural or a museum setting, we hear stories told about others. Maybe we even hear stories told about ourselves, but we're not often invited to share those stories from our own voice. We thought about how to go outside of the museum, um, where programming, where historical and artistic product most fit, and to take it there. Um, this was part of an exhibition we did related to the history of surfing, and a huge amount of what we did was down by the water. Um, 
And we said, when it comes to things like collections and exhibitions, we are going to find really clever ways to invite people to bring their objects and their stories in. So this is a close up from an exhibition called Memory Jars, where we invited hundreds and hundreds of people to bottle up a memory in a jar and put it on display. The exhibitions we ended up creating looked fundamentally different because they were co-created with different kinds of people. So for example, this exhibition, Lost Childhoods, was co-created by teenagers who are foster youth or children in care. So these are teenagers who don't have adult, um, adults in their lives. Um, and it was about their experience growing up and how it connects to all of our experiences growing up and as a community. Again and again, we looked for opportunities to invite people to bring forward the fullness of themselves. You know, I think when we think about participatory design, we often think, well, our visitors, do they really have anything to offer? Do they have anything interesting to share? Um, and what we found again and again is that when you design a supportive space where people feel really welcome and safe, they will bring something incredible into that space and they'll be, bring things in that we could never curate, that we could never design ourselves when we invite people to unlock that from their own experience. Now I'm showing a lot on the programming side, but I want to go back to that challenge we were facing. The challenge of relevance, I think you can imagine how we were addressing um, through all of these new activities, but we were able to address the financial challenge as well. So when I came to the museum in 2011, it had an annual budget of $700,000 a year. We had seven staff members and we had about 17,000 visitors annually, the majority of whom were retired white people and school children. Um, this is what it looked like for my final full year at the museum. That year we had a budget of 3 million, we had 40 staff and we had 148,000 visitors. And those visitors reflected the age diversity of our county, the income diversity of our county and the ethnic diversity of our county. And that's what success looked like to us. Yes, wow, right? Um, we made this kind of change. We changed our museum, not by bringing in fancy exhibits or building a new building, but by doing that flip from an institution first approach to a community first approach. Now, a lot of people look at these numbers and they say, okay, but how did you do it? Um, it's the reason I get to speak with groups like you today, that there's a lot of curiosity about the how behind it. And so um, in my last year at the museum, we went searching in our story for a pattern. And when we found it, we found that it was very simple. We believe that the, mod, the museum was successful because we became of, by, and for our community. What that means is on the of side, our team became more representative of our community. On the buy side, more of our programs were created and co-created by our community, and that made us welcoming for our community. We realized that this pattern was not just happening at our organization, it was actually happening at great community transformation organizations all over the world. And so in May of 2018, we launched this website with the idea that we were going to create a space for practitioners around the world to share the work we're all doing to engage communities more deeply. Um, so our mission is really to equip civic and cultural organizations to become of, by, and for their communities. And we believe when you do that, communities grow stronger because people feel more empowered and able to share their stories, and the organizations grow stronger as well because we have more intendants, we have more money coming in, there's more of a sense of public value seen commonly. What we do has kind of two pieces. Um, we have a website and some resources that are freely available. I give talks and workshops like this. And then we also have this deeper program called the Change Network, where as Peter was mentioning, there are dozens of organizations around the world that are going through an intensive program with us to become more of, by, and for the communities that matter most to them. Uh, right now we have 43 organizations in the network. Um, that includes in Europe organizations in the Netherlands, in the UK, in Ireland, in Wales, and in Poland. Um, I'll just say we would love to have more organizations in Europe involved. So if you're interested afterwards, feel free to get in touch with me. 
Um, but I want to unpack a little bit of what this really looks like in practice. Oh, and I guess I'll just note also, since this often comes up, um, that if you want the slides from this presentation, um, uh, hold on, let me get to the right window again. Okay, if you want the slides from the presentation, um, I'll just put in the chat this link and you can download them anytime um, and uh, they'll be available to you. Um, so, but let's talk about what this really means in practice. So it means asking ourselves questions about changes we're able to make. So what changes would enable you to become more representative of your community? What changes could help your programs be more co-created by your community? And what changes could help your programming be more for this community? Um, this is sort of our cheat sheet of what these kinds of changes look like, the different places that this work happens. And it's the reason we call our core program the Change Network, because what we're trying to do is support organizations in making change to move in this direction. So I realize this can be a little abstract, um, and I, I want to just note that what we've seen again and again is that actually um, if we're trying to become four communities who have not participated um, in the past, one of the most powerful ways to do it is to become of and by them. That very frequently we focused very much on the four side, and there's a lot of power on the of and by side. And I want to give you an example. Um, I saw we had somebody from Perth, but Perth, Ireland. Um, this is um, a photo from a place on the other side of the world. This is actually in Brisbane, Australia. Has anybody been to Brisbane? About 50 people. It's a little dicey that maybe, okay, maybe it's a no in this case. Um, but next time you go to Brisbane, Australia, I encourage you to go see this. Oh, oh, great. Okay, we have a couple. Oh, they're always, I feel like there's always one. Great, thank you. Um, Next time you go to Brisbane, Australia, I encourage you to go see the State Library of Queensland. Um, it's an incredible library, one of the most beautiful I've seen. And I was lucky enough to be there just after it opened 10 years ago. Um, and at the time, you know, brand new contemporary library, white, gleaming, open plan, very beautiful. And I was there as part of a group who were trying to develop a piece of the library that had not opened when it opened. And that was a space they were calling the Curl Duggan, or the Indigenous Knowledge Center. You see, as you know, in Australia, there's quite a large population of Indigenous Aboriginal people. Uh, the State Library of Queensland wanted to be a place for everybody to access their mission of sharing knowledge and building community. And so they knew they wanted Aboriginal people to be part of that. But they also knew that historically, most of the people who came to the library were white, and they weren't really sure what it would look like to make a welcoming library for Aboriginal people. So what do we do when there's a group of people we want to design something for, and we don't really know a lot about them? In my experience, what we usually do is we guess. We, it's like we design a surprise party for people we don't know. And we say to ourselves, oh, maybe they'll like this kind of food, maybe this kind of music. When we do this kind of guessing, often we end up with a disaster. Either the people who we thought we were building this for don't come, or they come and they say, why did you get this kind of food and this kind of music? And why did you make these assumptions about us that are so wrong? And meanwhile, we're sitting feeling so proud that we did something for this community and why can't they just be grateful? In the case of the State Library of Queensland, they decided they didn't want to take this guess approach. Instead, they decided that they were going to start on the of and by side of this equation, that they were going to build a community advisory group of Aboriginal people so that the ideas for the Coral Duggan would be created by Aboriginal people. And I was lucky enough to be there at one of the first meetings of this community advisory group. Um, I was there as kind of a consulting designer. So there we were in this gleaming white room and there's librarians and there's Aboriginal elders and there's designers and architects like me. And we're sitting down to talk about what could happen. And one of the very first things that one of the Aboriginal advisors said was, you know, the way we share knowledge is not fundamentally through books. 
It's through music and dance. And it's gotta be intergenerational. It can't be so sterile like a hospital. And you could see the librarians looking around at their gleaming white space with new eyes. And then, and then one of the Aboriginal elders said, you know, the most important way we share knowledge is around a fire. I don't know how many librarians you know, but this was a moment of truth, right? They had to decide, were we for real when we said we wanted to make our library for Aboriginal people? Or were we secretly hoping they would walk through the gleaming white doors that we've built and thank us for the privilege of doing so? And to their great credit, these librarians were for real. And they took one of those gleaming white spaces and they made it a colorful intergenerational space for music and dance. And even more impressively, they found an outdoor space where they built this fire pit so that groups like the, this Youth World Indigenous Youth Congress could come together to share knowledge and build community, which was exactly the mission of this institution. You know, when we're building something new, often we can make it powerful gestures and um, activities like this, but in some ways what's even more powerful is what the library's done in the last 10 years since all of this opened. Because of the Curl Duggan, for the first time, they hired librarians who were Aboriginal. For the first time, they had many programs that were co-created by Aboriginal people. And while it started in the Indigenous Knowledge Center, it's now spread throughout the library. And it's made the whole library a welcoming place for the people they wanted to be involving. And it's made it so not just for one event or in one space, but sustainably throughout the organization. Now, I think you can see how powerful this can be. And so what I wanna invite us to do is to try this together. Um, so there's two things I'd love for you to do if you can. One is if you have a pen and some paper, I'd love for you to write the words of, by, and for big on some different pieces of your notebook. So it look, kind of looks like this in the end. It doesn't actually matter how big or small your paper is because you can hold it very close or very far. And as you may guess, I'd also ask you if you're able to turn on the video. Um, you'll stay muted, but please turn on your video if you can. And I'm going to stop sharing slides for this piece. Okay. Great. Okay, I can see many of you. Do some people, does anybody, if you have paper, can you wave it up? Can, do people have time to do this? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, and when you do this, especially if you wrote with a normal pen, don't be afraid, you can get so close to your camera, it's okay, um, so don't be afraid of that. Here's what we're gonna do. Oh, I love seeing all your faces. Thank you for um, whoever put us on gallery view, that's perfect. Um, what I wanna invite us to do is to imagine for a moment that we all work for an imaginary museum. And it's okay if your video can't open, um, we're gonna use the chat as well in this. I want to imagine we work for an imaginary museum of animal history, okay? And we have historically done a great job involving cats and dogs. Cats and dogs come to our museum all the time. But birds, they don't really come. We're not exactly sure why, but we would really like to become of, by, and for birds. So what I'm gonna invite you to do in a moment you can start thinking about it, but I'm gonna play a song and I'm going to invite you while the song is going for a couple of minutes to just in the chat, share any idea you have about how we could become of, by, and for birds. You don't have to say if it's an of, a by, or a for idea. Any idea right now is a good idea if it's helping us think about how we could involve birds in our museum of animal history. Does this make sense? Okay, great. I'm going to play a song and you guys can go to town. Rock and Robin, sweet, 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 sweet,
Sorry, that was abrupt accidentally, but you had so many great ideas. I love it. Um, thank you for all these great ideas. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to invite you, if you have pieces of paper that say of, by, and for, um, I'm going to share a couple of the ideas that came out. And I want to invite you to think about, does this feel like an idea that lives mostly in the of category the by category or the for category. So I'm going to share an idea and then I'm going to invite you to pull out the piece of paper you think fits most with it. Um, so um, one of the ideas I saw from actually many people, which I loved, was to um, create entrances on the roof or build programming space on the roof. Um, which of these categories do you think we're in when we talk about creating program space or entrances on the roof? You can hold it up, be bold, yeah. Great, I'm seeing a lot of four. Yeah, this is a, a classic four example. Um, uh, what about, I, I saw one that said, um, let them sing. Where would you put let them sing? I see some of, I see some by, nice, mostly by, yeah. I, uh, there was also a beautiful one that came with this one. Somebody said, let them sing, sing with them which I think is kind of a beautiful encapsulation of the two sides of by. Um, this idea that we're creating space for people, or for, sorry, for birds um, to share their voices and that we're gonna do it in to some extent in partnership with each other. Um, what about um, birds on the curatorial committee to help make the next exhibition? Birds on the curatorial committee. Yeah, this is a great of one, um, absolutely. Um, there was another similar or, or another of one I saw about birds on the board, which is great. Um, and then let's see, the, the other one I wanna ask about is, um, I saw there were a bunch of you thinking about the cats, um, which seems like very reasonable. Some people were saying we need a cat-free zone. Some people were saying we need to get rid of the cats. Um, I'm curious, which of these categories would you kind of lean into to figure out what to do about this birds, cats situation? I see some of, I see some for, I see, yeah, some by and yeah. So this is one of these things where you can use all the parts of the framework because um, if you take an approach that is only for, what you're likely to do is to get into a place where you're debating, well, will we have some days for birds and some days for cats? Will we have some spaces for one or some for the other? Or will we decide which of these we prefer or is a higher priority to us and make it for them and not the other? If you start bringing of and by into this, you start getting to a place where you can think about how different communities intersect. So for example, you know, if you hold a meeting with advisors who are both birds and cats and you talk about how can we e coexist in this space together, you might come up, they might come up with some clever ideas in the four category you haven't thought of. If you find, gosh, you know, we got a lot of cats on the board and they feel like the birds only need a little closet and why are they complaining? Maybe you need to have more bird representation so that there's more of a conversation about the different needs of different communities. So I think that particularly when we're talking about groups who may have been marginalized or who may be in conflict with the dominant group in your space, if we don't do the of and by side, we're likely to give them a very small portion of what we do on the for side. I wanna just also notice how many of our ideas, and there were so many ideas, how many ideas um, were in the category um, of four? 
And um, that's not to say that that's bad, but just to note how quickly we all as interpreters and as designers jump to ideas about making nests, offering food, um, creating space, perching branches, things like that. It's not that that's bad, but I wanna just note and invite us to notice it because we've all really been conditioned, I believe. Um, we've all really been trained to focus on the four side of the equation. And so I think there's actually quite a lot of healthy, meaty work we get to do if we want to think about playing on the of and by side as well. Um, and we hear this from the members in our um, change network as well. Um, somebody said to us after a few months in the program, you know, they said what had become very clear was that we thought we were doing things that were of and by our community. But like most nonprofits, we were doing things for them rather than asking our community if these were serving them in the best way. And I think particularly with interpretation, when we think about some of the core conflicts about this question of who has the right to interpret whose story, a lot of the conflict, I believe, is because we're debating who has the right on the for side. And we um, can think about, I think, getting past those conflicts if we start doing more work on the of and by side. Um, about six months into the program, um, when we asked people kind of what did they learn and what's the value so far, one of the very simple things that a head of education for a museum in Miami said was, you know, one of the biggest things we've learned is we don't sit around and plan programs without thinking about who it's for and why we're doing it. So I want to just take a few minutes to step through for you how um, we see organizations go through a journey over months to make these kinds of changes. And then we're gonna dive back into a little more interaction again at the end. Um, so we really see change as a process um, that takes time. Um, we see if you're really interested in institutional change, it starts with having a team. You can't make change alone. And then we always say the first thing to do is to create a vision, you know, just as we did with the birds. What would it look like if our organization really was of, by, and for all the people we're interested in? What does that look like five or 10 years from now? And then which communities are critical to building that future and how might we start involving them today? How can we start by being present, listening, and learning from them, being curious about what matters to them, instead of jumping immediately to guess what they might want? And then how can we make plans for changes based on what we've heard, so that we can then use tools, get support from each other, and make change? We've seen many different kinds of organizations go through this journey in different ways. Um, so, for example, in Wales, the Science Center TechniQuest in Cardiff said, you know what, there is a neighborhood all around us of people who are entrepreneurial, who are creative, who are interested in technology, and let's, instead of thinking that we need to be this huge institution for our whole country, let's really focus in on this community of neighbors and how they might be activated as the science, technology, and engineering leaders of the future of our city. In the Immigration Museum in Australia, in Melbourne, they said, you know, we for a long time have been successful engaging different communities at different times, kind of like the cat day versus the bird day, saying, okay, we're doing Diwali with Indian communities this week, we're doing um, a Balinese ceremony with that community next week. And they really said, we wanna lean in to how we bridge these communities and how in particular we can make changes on the of and by side so that it's not that we're for different people on different days, but we can be for different people together. Um, in the Netherlands at the Stedelijk Museum in Skidam, which is a small city outside of Rotterdam, um, they got quite radical and quite creative. One of the communities they were very interested in who they saw not participating in contemporary art was young, lower income men. Um, and they got curious about that community. They got curious about that community's assets, what they're proud of. And one of the kind of hot spots of community for these men was a boxing gym. And so their director of the museum, Deirdre Carrasso, um, decided that she wanted to see if they could form a partnership with this boxing gym. She came to the boxing gym. She said, we're really interested in what you do and who you work with. And we see that this is a real point of pride for men in our community. We'd like 
to build some relationships. And they said, okay, you've got to come train with us. And this woman in black here is Deirdre, the director of the museum. Uh, after a few months of training, um, she worked with the gym to stage a boxing uh, competition in the lobby of the museum. Um, there were a lot of men who fought and then the title fight was the director of the museum versus a local artist who's the other woman here. Um, the artist uh, won and she won a solo exhibition in the museum. So quite an unusual and an orthodox approach to how to select an exhibition, um, but a way to really honor and invite in um, people with a very different perspective on what they're proud of in the community and what creativity and community means to them. The thing we've heard again and again, and the thing I hope you'll walk away with, is the idea that um, for many people it feels overwhelming um, to think about whether you're thinking about inclusion, social inclusion, participation, equity, that we hear about these things and then we are excited but overwhelmed. And I really hope that this of, by, for framework can be one that you can take away tomorrow and start to think about how you can use it in the work that you do. And I think there's a fair question um, about why does this matter right now when our spaces are closed and the way we're interpreting or what we are interpreting or who we can work with is quite compressed. And to me, the reason it matters is this, because I believe if we don't change our approach, if we don't start leaning into the of and the by side, global inequality is going to get worse and our institutions will become for an even smaller number of people. They will be less relevant. They will be less financially sustainable. And I believe though, that if we can really start to get curious and energized and active around becoming of and by more diverse people, we can come out of this crisis positioned differently in our community in terms of our relevance as well as in terms of our sustainability and viability. And so what I would say to you um, is I really encourage you to not jump to making a change plan first. Don't start with that guessing and building the design part, the, the surprise party. Instead, start first by dreaming, you know, asking yourself, if I imagined my best possible scenario, in 2025, how is it different? And I invite you um, maybe for, let's take, let's take a three minute dream here. Um, I'll put on some music again, and I invite you to really think about if you could, in your best possible scenario, imagine who's participating and what's happening. Just if you write down some moments in that vision, and remember, this is your best possible scenario, not your worst. Um, I'm going to put on a, a song. I, I promise I won't cut it off this time. I'll give you the full three minutes. Um, but I invite you to think about this and then to um, come back. Um, before I do, I see that there's a question to me about the difference between of and by. Great question, one that comes up a lot. Um, to me, by is about partnership. It's about collaborating with groups or individuals who are not in your team to co-create programming. So for example, if you do a project where you say, we are going to invite um, this particular cultural group to come in and to put on an event, uh, that's on the buy side. Um, or if you say, we are gonna do a night um, where we are gonna, I remember there was a museum that used to do these things they called detours, um, where they had non-professional interpreters offer tours, and it might be a chef, it might be a dancer, um, but different kinds of people doing interpretation as partners, maybe as volunteers, maybe as contractors. Um, in the buy side would also be things like community advisory groups. On the of side, it's about getting closer into your team. Who's on your staff? Who's on your board? Um, who's in your intern or volunteer core? Now, obviously there is some overlap between buy and of. You know, is a curatorial committee more like an advisory group in by, or is it more like a board committee in of? To some extent, I would say those differences don't matter so much, um, but it does, I will say that um, uh, in my experience and at the museum, we took this approach, we started with by. For us, of felt overwhelming. We couldn't imagine in the beginning, how could we hire 
people who we didn't know? How could we bring people on the board from communities we didn't know? It felt both risky and it just felt like a huge effort. And we decided that if we first started by partnering to co-create programs with lots of new people, not only would we create great programming together, but we would start to meet the people who we might eventually recruit to become staff members, to become board members, or those partners may be the people who helped us find and recruit those individuals. Um, yeah, that's an interesting John saying of ownership by content creation and delivery. Yeah, I think there's different ways to look at it. Um, I think certainly if you're particularly, I think of um, in the UK, there's a lot of, um, I think about the Arts Council England's pretty robust um, uh, quota kind of based theories about um, looking at diversity and inclusion on your staff and board, that would be very clearly on the of side. I think that you can feel ownership as a collaborator, um, but there's a different level of how internal, how often are you engaging with the organization, how deep in are you with the organization. I also say that some of this is structural. So for example, one of the organizations in our network is a very small startup children's museum and theater in Poland. Um, there's only one guy who works for it. And so functionally, you know, it's not meaningful for him to think about who, how might he change who's on his staff. But it is meaningful for him to think about who are the partners I'm working with to produce theater or to create this museum. Um, and so some organizations may find that they focus more on the buy or the upside. Thank you for asking that. So let's come back to dreaming briefly. So in a moment, I'm gonna give you a song here um, and I'm gonna invite you to just kind of write yourself, it could be like some moments in the glimpses of your best possible future. What do you imagine happening? All right, and with that, I'm going to share my sound and I'm going to... Another moment for a couple people who want to chat in. Nice. Thank you. I, um, I encourage you to look at this chat uh, because it's exciting to see what people are envisioning. And I think that particularly right now in the midst of this crisis, um, it's a time when it's important for us to spend some time dreaming. Um, and I think that it can be so 
uh, weighing down to think about the suffering happening in the world. And even in our own work, thinking about what's going to happen today, what's going to happen six months from now. And if we can spend a little time dreaming about where do we want to go further into the future, I believe we'll set ourselves up to start to get there. Ah, some beautiful sentiments here. Thank you. Um, the last thing I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, the last thing I'm going to want to invite us to do is to think about this second step after the dreaming which is to think about what communities matter most to you right now. And I saw even in the chat, a couple people um, were already um, thinking about specific communities of interest for you. Um, one thing I've seen that some people have been very stressed about right now, and it's very confusing right now, is that there are so many different communities that are drawing our attention. Um, there are the audiences we had existed to engage in the past, there were people we were already moving towards. There are people we might be newly interested in because of what's happening with the crisis. And I go back to this idea that when you're doing community first design, actually the first step is to get really specific about which segments of the community you want to focus on so that you can get very curious about how you could build something rooted in what matters most to them. So I would invite you to think about these questions. Who were you engaging before the crisis? Who were you moving towards? And who's important to you right now? And I know that this is the kind of question um, where the answers for everybody will be different depending on where you are in the world. Um, so I don't necessarily ask you to chat them in, um, but I do invite you to think about this because if you can get clear on especially this third question, which communities are most important to you right now, I think you'll be in a position to move forward with more confidence and creativity and less stress and overwhelm. I know that there's an organization in our network in Panama um, where the um, director said to me, um, you know, my board, you know, we're a contemporary art center in a very low income neighborhood. And she said, my board is saying um, we have to be all about artists and we have to be all about the art right now. But I'm seeing that our neighborhood, the families in our neighborhood are really struggling and need food. And so I've created this food distribution program and it's going fabulously, but I feel like I'm called to do the food thing and my board is yelling at me about the art thing. And I said, have you talked with them about how do we want to prioritize these different communities that matter to us? Because the worst thing that can happen is somebody like this woman, Carolina, feels like, She's doing more than she possibly can handle, and she's feeling bad about it because she wishes she was focusing her energy in one particular place. So I invite yourself to the extent that you can to give yourself permission to really get focused on the communities that matter most to you. And I think that when we can do this, and I'll come back just to share for my last moment here. When we can do this, we can really think about how together we can build organizations that are of, by, and for everyone who matters in our community, everyone who we wish we could involve, but couldn't for some reason. And I think that now's a time where if you can give yourself permission to dream, if you can get focused on the communities that matter most to you, if you can lean into the of and the by side, um, you can really come out with something transformed and transformative.